welcome back to Time in Your Kitchen. I'm here with Garen, and we are going to be making up tortilla española and spicy bacon sofrito tonight. I think this is going to be a great way to close out finals week. I'm really excited. I hope you're excited too. I know it's already smelling good in here. The pans are hot, so let's get cooking. Okay, I'll be over on the chat. So if you have any questions while we're cooking, just put them in the chat and we'll, we'll ask and we'll get started. All right. Hi everybody, Chef Garen. Nice to see you. Gonna do something a little brunchy this evening. So hope you got everything ready. Are we switching over the cameras to our we overhead? We are switching to our overhead right now. All righty. So the first thing that you're going to want to start with is your bacon sofrito. Uh, since we're doing both of these dishes in skillets, it's necessary, the non-stick skillet is going to be for your tortilla espanola. It'll make it a heck of a lot easier. You can do this in other skillets like cast iron, but they're rather harsh edges rather than being kind of soft, um, kind of make it difficult for the turning phase of things. So what you're gonna do here is you're gonna take that skillet for your sofrito, you're gonna turn that puppy on, we're gonna get it nice and warm, and you don't need to grease it or anything because bacon has plenty of fat in it already. So I just have some diced bacon here. Just going to kind of plop that on in there. Pull something heat resistant out here so we can poke it around. A little bit of vegetable on this piece of bacon. It won't hurt anything. So our goal right now, we are going to begin rendering the fat out of this bacon. Um, the fat doesn't tend to come out right away. It actually takes a few minutes worth of cooking before it really starts coming out. Uh, you don't have to necessarily cook it till it's an absolute crisp. Usually when it's cooled, it continues to firm up a little bit, uh, but uh, truly you don't want it super, super crisp because a lot of the flavors of bacon tend to begin to diminish other than the saltiness. Uh, as they cook crispier and crispier. So getting that bacon nice and soft. And while that's happening, let's take a look at some of the other things that we have here for this dish. So right here in this bowl, I have some diced yellow onion. I have some diced red bell pepper. And then this finer red pepper right here is actually a Fresno chili, several Fresno chilies. Um, Fresno chilies, are somewhere around a jalapeno intensity. They actually look like a red jalapeno, but they don't have that green jalapeno flavor. It's just a very simple, modestly spicy chili. Um, I could recommend them for all nationalities of cooking. They're, they're really quite nice. Uh, we have here some diced tomatoes. I used romas. Uh, optionally, you can do what I did and remove the seeds from the center before you chop them. But if you don't have any uh, issues interstitially, uh, with digesting seeds. You don't have to worry about leaving them in. They don't affect flavor, mostly just appearance. Um, so set those two off to the side. And what we're also going to need here right now, and I'm gonna shift some things over, is some garlic. So whole clove garlic, if you don't have a garlic uh, masher, a, a garlic press around, uh, there's a really fun and easy way to get your garlic nice and fine. So what I do is I take a piece of plastic wrap and I put the garlic down on a cutting board like so, and I cover it with a piece of plastic wrap, just like this. <clears throat> Try not to pile it up too high, one single layer. And then we take the flat side of a meat mallet. This guy right here, nice and flat and wide. Then starting near the edge, not in the middle or else we'll go running. Tap. This not only helps us get a little bit of the juices running out of the cellular structure of the garlic, but it's it nice and fine without too much mess. If your plastic wrap doesn't look like mine just did. There we go. And then just shake that garlic off. And you can collect it into a pile with your knife. And if you choose to run it through just a few times, some of the fibers may still be holding intact. And that just saved your wrist a few miles, which is great, especially whenever, like me, you need things to be a little more ergonomic on your wrist. <laughs> so let's take a peek here. Move our bacon around a little bit.
I wish I had grabbed my splatter screen a few moments ago when I was on the other side of the kitchen. I'm going to get a little splashed by bacon. Kind of the name of the game. It's that adrenaline rush from that little tiny zing you get whenever you <laughs> get a little splash of oil on your skin. It's what we cooks live for. Would you like your sous chef to grab that for you? Oh, no, I'm okay. As I said, <laughs> it's that adrenaline rush. I need it. Plus, describing where it is would be, would have an easier time going down the street to the gas station than <laughs> me leading you through my cookware. There we go. So poke that bacon around, let it cook down. Uh, as you saw in the recipe, it's about 12 ounces of bacon. You don't need bacon to make sofrito. Bacon is my own personal addition. Uh, though in some ways bacon can kind of lower the, the elegance of a dish. Quite factually, I find it uh, able to meld with almost any nationality of cooking seamlessly. It's like the universal food bandage and cheese is its field mix. But I add bacon to this specifically because it's typically a vegetarian dish. It's actually a tapas to make uh, tortilla española. And so frito is a very general purpose salsa to put on just about anything. But whenever I was serving brunch, I always kind of found I needed something every now and then for a brunch to be really fulfilling, not just slightly. And that's when a little bit of sofrito and tortilla española has come to save my day. Go. We're cooking. So be patient for just a few moments longer on that. I'm going to show you a couple of other things just so you see, in case you haven't already gotten there or you want to make sure you did this right. Uh, this right here is our golden potatoes and our onions. So you'll notice I kind of cut them rather chunky. That's kind of the point, about a half an inch thick. Uh, nice and chunky because the thinner you do this, um, the less success and the more caramelization you'll get around the edges of these when you pre-fry them. Um, but that's something that we'll be doing in a minute. Uh, when it comes to the potatoes themselves, I kind of overestimated for you the amount of potato you need. This is about a pound and a quarter. I wrote about a pound and a half. If you did a full pound and a half of potatoes legit by weight, you might have a little extra potatoes, but it's better to have more than less. And you can still eat the potatoes after you fry. And we're getting somewhere here with this bacon. As I said, my goal isn't to make the bacon super crispy. It's actually just to make the bacon render out most of its fat. It'll golden a bit on the edges and things, but it won't turn super dark. And to keep the fat from getting gummy as well, you do want to cook it somewhat. There we go. Hopefully nobody had any difficulty with the preparations getting started for this dish. There was anybody who was. You just let us know. We're in that quiet time where we just listen to the sizzle. Listen to that sizzle. Smell yep. the good smells. So yes, Joyce, right now we are just getting started cooking the bacon. Um, glad you could join us this evening. Um, right now we, oh, we did uh, chop or we, we chopped the garlic. Yes, we already got we the garlic the nice garlic and well. I beat it with a hammer first. One way to do it. I don't like turning my knife sideways and hitting the knife. Not only because I respect my knives, but there's something about hitting a blade that just doesn't seem common sense like. I just don't like. Don't Striking so. a blade on the side that's super, super sharp just to me seems dangery. I've never quite liked it. Yeah, it doesn't seem like a good idea. No, Joyce, garlic is not in the baking yet. Garlic is over to the side. Yes, our garlic is still right here. If it got in the bacon though already, don't you worry. You haven't messed anything up. Just gonna have some nice roasty garlic. We're almost there with my bacon now. I can always tell because the foaming going on in the fat. The more foamy the fat becomes, the less moisture is left inside of the bacon. Let's see here. I'm going to use a small colander with a bowl here to collect my finished bacon. You can always use a, a plate with some paper towels on them or even a paper plate to help absorb that extra fat. Pop and sizzle. <laughs> Mm 
Oh, I hope you're not too close over there. Oh, it's I'm out of the don't want to get <laughs> to get Abby with her no lovely frying bacon. <laughs> it wouldn't be the first time, won't be the last for sure. Bacon's a hit in our house. I love it with um oh I do it to go in my soups sometimes. Uh, like to, to fry it up in the skillet for soup. I like a good carbonara every now and then. Mm. That's one of my favorite uses for bacon. Okay. Though technically it should probably be hog jaw bacon here in America. We're just going for slab bacon. Yeah. That's what we got here. There we go. So I'm starting to see some really good foaming and I'm starting to see some really nice goldening on the edges of my bacon. So now's the time when I'm going to begin removing it. I think a pair of tongs would be appropriate for this game. Be careful if you do this method, the bacon fat falling through the screen here and hitting the bottom of the bowl makes the bottom of the bowl very hot. Mm. So you wanna hold the side of the bowl when you do this. Now, um, did you use any oil for the bacon or just put it None in? None whatsoever. No All of the fat the renders straight out of bacon. Anytime you're starting a dish with bacon, never bother putting fat in the pan because bacon makes its own lovely, greasy, lardy, delightful fat. Super oh, Joyce is using turkey bacon. Hey, no shame. If your turkey bacon is super lean and doesn't put off any fat, you're gonna need a little bit of oil or butter. So the cup of oil is for something the later in the cup recipe. of oil is going to be for frying our potatoes and onions for the tortilla espanola. If you have to put down a little bit of fat in the pan because you had really lean bacon or turkey bacon in that scenario, um, that's a circumstance where you can reach for some butter or some neutral flavored oil or a little bit of olive oil. Won't hurt a thing. So what I'm going to do next, because I have all this lovely fat here, is I'm just gonna take this bowl here and I'm gonna strain off a little bit of the fat because we only need a few tablespoons of it. And we're gonna get our garlic down in the pan first. How crispy would you say the bacon is? Uh, Patricia says hers isn't quite crispy yet. It shouldn't be crispy, crispy. In fact, it shouldn't be really crispy at all. However, if you see the color on mine has begun to golden a little bit, that's what you're looking for. When the color all over starts to golden and your fat starts to foam like mine was foaming, that's exactly when you want to pull your bacon. If you wait till it's super crisp, you're going to lose a lot of the bacon flavor um, and it's going to actually still be kind of crunchy inside of your sauce and you don't want that. So next, the first thing whenever you're sauteing, the first thing that goes in your pan when you're sauteing things like onions, peppers, carrots, celery, if you're using garlic, put garlic in the pan first. If garlic doesn't get to saute in some fat before it comes in contact with other moist ingredients, it doesn't lose its bitterness. So you want to kind of blanch or even slightly golden your garlic in this fat. How hot should the pan be for that? Well, if it gives you any idea, I turned the pan off a moment ago. When I took out the bacon, I started to see vapor from the fume, from, mm -hmm. the, from the heat burning up the fat. That's when I turned it off for a moment because I'm using a cast iron skillet. It holds heat like a rock. So it's going to keep cooking for a moment. But then eventually, if I turn it right back on. I'm going to keep it to like a medium low temperature. As long as things are sizzling in this pan, that temperature is just fine. But if you get too high, you might notice the edges of things browning or blackening too fast. Um, and you also uh, might notice no bubbling at all if it gets a little too low. So once your garlic has had a moment to cook in the oil like this, it lightens in color first, and then it begins to golden. Uh, from caramelization of sugar on the exterior. So once it really has gotten to a point where it's lightening color, it's cooked in the grease for at least a minute. Then you can take your other more crunchy vegetables, our onion, our bell pepper, and my Fresno chili, for instance. As I said in the recipe, if you need this to be mild, just use a little extra bell pepper. No shame in having more bell pepper in the dish. There we go. And because I just touch that Fresno chili with my bare fingers, which I shouldn't have done. I'm going to rinse my fingers off really quick. We do not have that situation. Oh, burning fingers. <laughs> happens to me frequently enough because I don't think whenever I'm cutting chilies, but if you oil your hands ahead of time, it'll protect you very well. 
from touching chilies if you don't have gloves about. So now's a fun moment. We are going to cook down the peppers and onions a bit before we put in the tomatoes. The peppers and onions have to pretty much be fully sauteed to a point of tenderness before the tomatoes go in. To make this situation go a little faster, the best thing you can do is to add the salt in early. Uh, in this circumstance, adding salt to the vegetables will make them sweat, uh, make a hypertonic environment where the moisture gets pulled out of the vegetable just by using a little salt. So I'm gonna add a couple of pinches. I didn't know that's how that worked. I've seen recipes, I've done cooking before where you add the salt while the, the peppers or onions are in there, but I didn't understand why I was doing that. Yes, putting it in early helps them sweat a little bit. And it'll work for many vegetables, even when you're not cooking. For instance, if you wanna make a bruschetta with some tomatoes, but you hate when your bruschetta gets too juicy, all you have to do is dice the tomatoes like we have them diced here, uh, but then roll them, put a little salt in them and mix them up and then put them inside of a colander in the bowl. And that will help all the juice come out of the tomatoes so they won't be super juicy. And you'd need to add salt later anyway, so there's no shame, just try not to overdo it. There we go. We're cooking. Would that also go for things like zucchini or yellow squash if you're sauteing them with onions? Now, zucchini and squash are very fragile vegetables. They're going to lose a lot of turgor very fast. Uh, so they probably won't eat that frequently. I'd salt those later. But the crunchy vegetables certainly love it. Things like celery, carrots, peppers, onions, crunchy things. Okay. There we go. Now, I don't want to exceed too high of a heat. So this is actually, this burner doesn't make a very high flame, but I would say at home, you want it around medium. As long as you got sizzling all the way to the edges of your pan, um, naturally, it's going to build up in the middle first. But when using a thick pan like a cast iron or a heavy bottom, bottom steel pan, that's when you're going to have difficulties uh, getting the heat to completely disperse across the pan. Slow preheating is one of the tricks that helps. However, given that I was cooking bacon, I just jacked that puppy up and threw the bacon. <laughs> Never hurt at all with bacon, just to help it render out all that extra fat. There we go. And once we get these vegetables to a point where I'm satisfied with their tenderness, is when we'll begin working on our tortilla. But this is going to have to keep cooking down once we get the tomatoes in it for a little bit. I keep playing with it, but it's best to kind of let it sit on the surface for a good 30 seconds or so before stirring, 30 seconds to a minute. Really help the heat come up through the vegetables a bit. Because the more I agitate them, the more frustrated they get. And then they don't get some. It feels like you're helping when you do it. Like you're not really helping <laughs> the no. peppers. And, and one of the worst habits is like whenever you're stirring pots, sometimes the side, like if it's a deep pot, the side that's against you gets stuff built up on it and you don't scrape it down. And then you end up with like one lone crunchy vegetable in yes. the midst of what's cooking. Yes, the sacrificial carrot. Mm -hmm. This little guy here. That's a pet peeve of mine. Get those onions off of there. <laughs> It's a very heat intensive spatula, good up to like 450 degrees. Ooh. You're using rubber spatulas to cook with. When you buy them, make sure you know their heat threshold. If their heat threshold below 400 degrees, it's not good for sauteing because sauteing on the bottom of your skillet, that exceeds temperatures when it's dry well beyond 400 degrees, six to 800 degrees for good searing. Wow. And I once stuck a rubber spatula into a pot where I was toasting sesame seeds without thinking, should have been a wooden spoon. I came back up with just the handle. The spatula <laughs> just disappeared. It's because sesame seed holds heat like a rock. It definitely exceeded the temperature threshold for that spatula. It was a Sir La Top spatula too. Hmm. I know, you'd think that they'd do a little better, but sometimes the cheaper ones are made for some good heavy use. Alrighty. So sofritos come in actually a few different varieties. There's green sofrito, there's Puerto Rican sofrito. This one's more of a Spanish style sofrito. 
Some of them add or remove ingredients. Some of them just use green ingredients given their day sofrito. So you may have already experienced one of these before. Mm -hmm. well, starting to see a little skin come off of my peppers. So I know I'm starting to get a little more tender here. Ooh, oh yeah, smells great in here. Mm -hmm. Cooking away. For those of you at home using glass cooktops, I have a glass cooktop at home as well. Many of my recipes are written with the timing in mind for glass cooktops. Uh, for instance, whenever it comes to our, our tortilla here, the cook timing is going to be about four minutes, but on this, it could possibly take as little as two to three minutes before I have to flip. Hmm. But that's the same situation here. If you're using a glass top stove, it's probably going to be just a little longer for you than it is for me to get these vegetables to tender. And that's just because the heat is very, very gentle, not very intense or focused like fire is. Well, Joyce wants to know, how will she know what color the turkey bacon should be? Okay, so when it comes to turkey bacon, it's not going to golden as dramatically until like the last moment when it's gonna darken. If it's still flexible and beginning to crisp on the edges, that's when you'll want to pull it because you don't wanna wait till it's super, super crispy. It won't harm anything particularly, but you just won't get as much flavor out of that bacon. And on top of that, it'll have a, a texture that you'll feel inside of your sofrito. Patricia asks, should I drain some of the oil off the bacon? My vegetables look a little soupy. Oh, yes. If you didn't notice earlier, I took away all of the oil, but about two or three tablespoons after the bacon saute. So you should uh, displace that to a heat safe dish. Something ceramic or metal would probably be best. Be careful, some glass dishes don't like having hot oil poured into them. They can break. All right. All right, so what I'm gonna do next, I'm gonna take my tomatoes here, to dump in my tomatoes. There we go. And now is also a good time for me to get in my seasonings because my tomatoes have gotten inside. It is a good time for seasoning. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna hit it with a little bit of black pepper. I'm not shy with the black pepper, I love black pepper. And a little bit of some ground rosemary. Now ground rosemary can be kind of intense. So to give you an idea of how much I'm using, this is a quarter teaspoon. We'll go easy. If you feel like being a modest, maybe just a tiny little pinch more. I do love rosemary. But it is an intense ground herb. When rosemary is dry, it's more intense than when it's fresh. Thyme has the same circumstance. There we go. Now, you'll need to stir this once the tomatoes get inside. You could lose all of your heat. Your sizzling just disappears all at once. Jack that heat up for a moment till our sizz your sizzling returns. And you're going to have to completely stir it around touching all of the surfaces uh, once every minute or so, just to make sure nothing begins to stick and caramelize there. There we are. Get all my little baby bits off of my spoon. Let that sit for a moment. And now, actually, if you have your wine, Add that now as well. I'm using sherry specifically as a wine. It's nice and sweet and robust, but you can use something drier if you wish. And of course, our smoked paprika. You can use typical paprika for this game. However, if you want it to be really good Spanish pimenton, smoked paprika is the best way to go. Uh, it, it really does imbue quite a lot of power, not just a smoky flavor, but kind of a deep, deep paprika flavor. 
uh, more so than the typical Hungarian paprika ever gets. If you want to be a little immodest, just like me, maybe just a little extra pinch, never hurt anybody, or a heaping tablespoon, a heaping teaspoon worth of paprika in there. Can we use red wine? Yes, you can use red wine. Now keep in mind, red wine has the ability to manipulate flavor a little bit. Um, the deeper burgundy it is, those bright orangey red colors tend to kind of uh, darken a little bit. So it will adjust, it will change your color a little bit, but as far as flavor goes, red wine is just fine to put inside of tomato and pepper sauces. You see things are getting kind of gooey in there. Smelling real nice. Whenever everything's cooked down a bit, I'll taste it once more, just to make sure I don't need a little bit more salt. So while that's happening, let's move on to our tortilla española. Now, before we begin, make sure you have your eggs in a nice big bowl, sit them off to the side with a whisk. You're gonna need yourself a pair of tongs. You're gonna need a large plate. I'm gonna put a few paper towels on this to collect what we fry. But the most important part of this plate is it needs to be bigger than the skillet. So we're, this is a 10 inch skillet. You need a 12 to 14 inch plate because what you're going to be doing after the tortilla cooks on one side is putting the plate on top and flipping it over, which is part of the reason I recommended something light and non-stick. Cast iron is a wonderful non-stick, but it is not light. And flipping it upside down like this could be very challenging for some of you. So just be careful. I'm going to set this off to the side right around here. And I'm going to put a couple of paper towels on trying to determine I think that's I think that's the rosemary I'm smelling you're smelling quite a bit of rosemary and of course yes. the sherry interacting with mm. everything so what we're going to do is we're going to turn this puppy on you want to make sure your flames if you're using a flame-based skillet are underneath the skillet if the flames are so big that they're reaching around the sides you're not doing yourself any any help it's not making your pan heat faster those flames reaching around the side are pulling heat all the way up and around the pan instead of focusing underneath it where it needs to heat up. So you're going to need, I wrote about a cup of oil. It does not have to be exact. Uh, that's just a, a measurement to let you know how much you could need. So it's good to have that much around. But pour enough oil into the bottom of the pan that you have roughly about a half an inch of oil, something you can fry in. And to give you an idea, just to show you the oil that I'm using, I'm using a smooth olive oil. It's lower in color and flavor than typical olive oils. There's less uh, grassy particles in there giving it the color and the flavor and the bitterness and the grassiness. If you're gonna fry something, don't use your nice grassy zesty olive oil that's usually very expensive. You don't wanna cook that oil at all because those particles cook off and then just turn bitter and they don't taste good. Uh, worse yet, you've just destroyed a really expensive oil that's meant to go on stuff raw. So use something cheaper, use something lighter in color. If it's labeled as classic olive oil, what they mean is it's not so extra virgin. Mm. It's probably second or third pressing. Okay. Sometimes it could have other oils involved. That's where the virgin part kind of tends to dissipate. But when it comes to frying with an olive oil, you don't have to go for the nice stuff. Go for the less expensive kind. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with the thickly sliced golden potatoes. You can use any potato you want, but golden is probably the most accurate potato for the circumstance. Mm. So that's what we're using. And what I do to test if I'm ready to drop them puppies in is I look for bubbles when I drop a slice in and I have just a little bit of bubbles. It's not very fervent yet, but. I do see a tiny bit of bubble. I can see it on the camera bubbles. as well. Just little a little bubble. Bubbles. Is Idaho considered golden? Now Idaho potatoes and russet potatoes, Idaho's are like a large russet. They're super starchy. Unlike these potatoes, these potatoes have a higher moisture content in them and less starch. So those potatoes tend like russets and Idaho's make French fries really great and they golden really, really well. They fry with mm. really rich colors. Um, so it's important that you try to focus on using a potato that has a thinner skin and a higher moisture content. That'd be red or gold potatoes. I tend to think the golden potatoes almost have more of a buttery taste on their own. They are a little, they, they have a slight yeah. sweetness to yeah. them. Definitely a little bit more. And I would say that's because in a russet or an Idaho potato, 
all of the sugars are in the form of a starch mm, rather okay. than the form of actual sugar, where these are much less starchy. So we're gonna fry these papes until they begin to lightly golden. I know that's something I've said already like 30 million times, but what I mean lightly golden is they're not going to brown. If they get too brown, they won't be good appearance wise for your dish. We just want to cook them so that the inside is soft enough for us to eat. You don't want it to have any kind of crunch in its bite. You want it to have the texture kind of of a home fry. Ooh. Though some of you might like your home fries really crispy. So in that circumstance, not like a home fry. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll see, whenever I pull them out, they break easily when you bend them. I'm thinking about all the great ways we've made potatoes this, this semester. So we've fried them now. I know, you think that's our theme. Frito. I need to think about that. Uh, we're potato people. Listen, in, in eastern eastern Ohio, western Pennsylvania, we're a strong potato people. So potato pride. <laughs> uh, we had them in the, the pierogies. Mm -hmm. We mashed them for that. We had them with the gnocchi. Now we're putting Ooh. them into a tortilla. We had the, the sweet potato. Oh my goodness, we really are potatoing. We're potatoes. I'm even taking on the shape of a potato. Oh, Karen, we're potatoes. <laughs> Can we become carrots by next fall? <laughs> that orange color, though. <laughs> Very oomphalumpa-ish. It is. Maybe celery. It's okay. This, this is July. We're going to do some much lighter affair. Yes. Oh. We're talking like international cold food preparation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe like a cold soup, like a vicious or a gazpacho. Maybe some sushi. I'm excited for that. Or some tabbouleh salad. Tabbouleh. We mentioned tabbouleh. I do love making tabbouleh. It's I actually a very that. easy dish. It's a complicating number of ingredients. Mm. So keep an eye. The oil temperature can get really, really high. You don't want to go crazy. So as long as we're bubbling and boiling away, you're good. You start seeing a lot of vapor, like not water vapor, like smoke. You're getting really high. Or if you're browning these potatoes super fast, so they start browning within like a minute. Your temperature is really high. You can either turn it off for a moment or turn it all the way down to low, but we do want to keep frying just without the intensity of that heat. My sofrito has cooked down quite significantly, so I'm going to turn it off because I know that, see how soft everything is and kind of mushy? Mm. That's that's ready. That's good and done. Now, Joyce asked, can I fry the garlic? I'm allergic to tomatoes. Now, if you don't, if you're allergic to tomatoes and you don't touch, uh, if you, you really want to stay away from them, uh, just use more bell pepper. It's nice and sweet. So bell pepper, onion, and garlic will actually complete the profile for this, but they don't have very much moisture like tomatoes. So consider taking a couple of tablespoons of water and just dumping it in and mixing it around to help things begin to soften up for you. All righty, so I think I'm ready to flip my potatoes. See the goldening? You see that difference in color? That's about as dark as I want them to get. Don't let them brown. You'll have to go in the order you drop them, assuming you remember the order you drop them in. If you're me, yeah. sometimes. Just checking underneath to see if they're all, not all cooking at the same rate. That one corner like, like gets a little bit more hot. So what am I actually gonna do? Look at that so free though. All done. Came done a little faster than I thought, but I did have that temperature roaring for a moment. Did we oh. add salt to the potatoes? We no, no. You don't want to salt these potatoes at all. There's no need. We will put salt into the eggs, however, when we beat them. So now I'm going to start flipping my other pieces. And the last thing that's going to go into your sofrito is your bacon. So if you're at the stage that I am, feel free to upend your bacon into the sauce and stir it all around. I'm going to do that in a moment here once I get all these potatoes flipped. There we go. We got some nice colors building up on them. Set that off to the side. Be careful if you're like me and you put this plate really near the skillet with the paper towel on it. That's asking for fire circumstances. It's a do as I say, not as I do circumstance. I'm trying to fit it all in this camera, <laughs> but get that bacon right on in there. I'm going to leave this bowl here with this colander because I'll need something to collect the onions in after I fry. Mm, bacon goodness. I'm going to mix that into my sofrito. 
Oh, yes. I hope the smells in your homes are delicious. Yes, Joyce, let's take a look at your bacon. No. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, uh, let's let me take see. a look. Okay, I'm trying to. This is, I'm not very good with this. Okay, That's so. That's okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. I almost had it. Okay, I got How we look at Oh, yes, that's some nice looking bacon. I think that bacon's ready to come out. Thanks. Yeah, you're My ready. My oil's not Time cooking. to move on to your garlic. Uh, I just... And if you I, don't have I, a little I, oil in there, make sure that you put a little bit of butter or some olive oil or something down in your pan. Because I, I, I think you were the one that used the, the turkey bacon. Was, was, was she the one who used yes. turkey? Yes, yep. Yeah, she's yes. going to probably need a little bit of oil if she doesn't have any in there already. I'll put some more in. Thanks. Sure thing. Pulling Thanks for sharing. These taters. I'm going to put the rest of my taters in next because naturally all of them didn't fit in at once. There we go. The rest of the taters here. Ooh, look okay. A little smooth boss of music. Mm. Good cooking music. There we go. Oh, oh. And we're off. So next is going to be the onions. I forgot all about the onions. I've been very involved with these potatoes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we've got the onions too. I cut these like an hour ago and amount of smell they give off as they sit is just so intense. Now that's just a white onion or this is a yellow yellow onion. onion. Spanish okay. yellow onions are the most common for this dish. Hey, uh, that you could sense. use just about any variety of onion. Just keep in mind if you use red onions, they brown as they cook. Mm. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's a color situation, not a flavor situation at that point. I tend to use a lot of red onions in my cooking at home. Yeah, when you cook with them, it doesn't harm anything at all. Just sometimes a little bit of extra color. Yeah, them. sure. A little extra caramelization color, if anything, because those purple notes just turn straight to brown whenever the heat they deforms the protein that gives off that lovely color. Protein work right there. Oh, frying, frying. If you must know the temperature of frying oil, it's about 350 degrees. Um, 350 to 375 is quite common for frying. Very few things will ever, ever ask for a 325 and nothing will ask for 400. Reason why is because once you start getting so hot, you start getting smoke point. On top of that, putting wet food into oil that's as high as 400 just caused the oil to overflow. Um, so keep that in mind, like if you're ever deep frying something, not shallow frying like this, a thermometer should be in that oil at all times so you can constantly see, uh, unless you're using a fry daddy. If you have a deep fryer at home, it'll control the temperature for you just by the setting that you put it on. Nose. Now, while that goes on, and these are still frying, let's take a look, see here. Eggs. Now, the recipe calls for eight eggs. I had jumbo eggs, <laughs> so I only put in seven. Jumbo eggs have a significant amount more volume than a typical egg. Typical eggs should be about a quarter of a cup. Uh, however, these jumbo eggs reach a third or sometimes more, so you got to be careful about that. Um, but if you're using standard size eggs, it'll work just to the recipe, about eight eggs. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to break them up a little bit. I'm going to switch with this whisk. Be thorough. You want to break all of the membranes that are inside of the egg. There are three membranes typically in an egg. Um, there's two inside that... One of them's around the yolk, one of them's around the white. And then there's another membrane that's literally on the inside of the shell. And you know that membrane because whenever you peel the egg, it's that one that keeps the whole egg in one piece. Oh, yes. Uh, that egg ends up, that membrane ends up on the shelf. Don't have to worry about it. However, 
The other two membranes, you need to beat them up pretty good. You don't have to worry about taking out the little white part inside of there. That's a, just a natural part of the egg made of the same proteins and things that are inside of the egg in general. So you don't have to worry about them being distasteful or the texture being noticeable. The only thing that people remove them for is sometimes in fancy cakes or chocolate custards, it doesn't break down. And so there's a little tiny white, like little tiny white thing in the middle of your cake or your custard. <laughs> That's the reason people like to remove them. Other than just simply being fussy, which is a reality for many of us. <laughs> so right here, we're gonna need some salt. Good sprinkle of salt. If I only give another sprinkle of salt, I'd say that was roughly half a teaspoon. And then some pepper. The eggs are going to change color slightly. They tend to get a little darker whenever you salt them like that. It does something to the protein inside of the egg when you beat salt into it. Same thing that it kind of does with the vegetables. Pulls moisture out of cellular constructs. So let's see. Oh yeah, we're golden in pretty nicely here. Start pulling out some of these pieces. Oh yeah. Some good looking taters. And as I said, they they might even feel slightly crisp to the surface, but your goal isn't necessarily crisping. It's actually just to get the interior of the potato to cook enough to be soft so you can bite through it and it's not hard or crunchy. Guys, drain and cool off. And then, just in the same way as the potatoes, take those that whole chunked up onion, thickly sliced. You can dice them too if you want it. There would be nothing inappropriate about dicing them. If you're one of those people that you know doesn't like textures too much, cook them till they're soft if you must. I understand. However, for the most part, they're not cooked until the point where they caramelize and brown. So they tend to keep a bit of, just a little bit of their texture. And it's part of the reason I cut them so thick, because the finer you cut them, the easier, the higher the surface area, the easier the heat penetrates into the onion and makes it soften. So that is the reason for this chunky onion. Hmm. But as I said, if you don't like it chunky, now's your chance. Chop it all the way. <laughs> don't worry too much about it. You might need a slotted spoon for retrieval, you know, something with some holes. If my tongs don't quite do it for me, this little guy will. So a little talk of tortilla española, since we're making it. Um, many people easily confuse it with a frittata. However, a frittata is Italian and not Spanish in origin. And it's important to know that a frittata is finished in the oven where a tortilla española is flipped entirely over and then put back onto the skillet. Oh. Um, and another important thing is a frittata typically has milk in it, sometimes bread. It's more custardy. Mm. A frittata is definitely a more custardy situation. It's kind of loose and soft. This is more eggy. Uh, however, the complete cooking of this is up to you. Uh, many people, when they make this dish, like to leave it slightly runny. Not necessarily okay. runny, but soft. Not as runny as a, span, as a French omelet, but definitely a little softer than you'd probably want your scrambled eggs in the morning, unless you like them that way, that's the point. Um, however, when I do this, there's typically just the thinnest layer of slightly undercooked eggs still in the middle. And that's culturally accurate. However, it may not be a good reality for some of you. So I understand if you need to cook it a little longer than I do. Sure. Now, would that be kind of in the same family then as a quiche? I guess you could, so this would be a, a quiche, a, like the French have quiche, the Italians have frittata, and the Spanish have tortilla espanol. Okay. All very old dishes, they all kind of stole it from each other, and one kind of claims that they're the original. It's kind of like pizza. <laughs> it's like, I don't care if it was the French or the Italians, either one, I just want to kiss them on the face for making me pizza. Exactly. <laughs> whoever, whoever brought me that pizza. It was really a, a multicultural jam fest mm -hmm. that brought the glory of the pizza to people. And this is the same situation with these lovely breakfast egg dishes that are big enough to serve several people at once. I can never get a straight answer out of anybody about like what the best time to eat a tortilla espanola is. Huh. It can be a breakfast food, but it's most often served in the afternoon as a tapas with wine. 
as with most no tapas, to that. yeah. As with most tapas, it likes some wine. Many of the times, this is just served with a little bit of aioli on top, or just some, just some like pickled peppers, some so, some random small kind of garnishing. Okay, give it a little color. It was my own personal, you know, artistic license and and love of sofrito that got me to start putting Spanish sofrito on Spanish tortilla. It, it just felt like it was supposed to gather. And it, it, it just, <laughs> to me, it just completes a very mealy profile, not just a snack. You put a little cilantro on top. I am going to use the touch of Ooh, cilantro and a little like sour that. cream. Avocados Ooh. and cheese are also a good way to go. Okay. I'm all about an avocado. And as we said earlier, cheese just. Oh, a little cotija cheese. Oh, yeah. It's spelled cotija. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so it's really fun to pronounce. Yeah. But yeah, cotilla cheese. It's like the feta of Latin communities. It has this nice, dry, tart, crumbly nature that I absolutely love. All right. So my onions starting to get a little softer. They're shriveling a little bit. And certain edges are starting to brown a little. On. In just a moment, I'm going to pull them out because that browning is something I do want to avoid and I know they're cooking quite thoroughly down there in that oil. As I said, my slotted spoon here might be my friend for this particular adventure. I'll turn off my heat for a moment. Get my hand slightly. Shoot all my babies. Now, much like before, we have to pour off some of this grease. We only put this grease in here to help the frying. We're gonna get there. Oh, they're all runaways. Tongs it is. <laughs> Cleaning the spoon. Now be kind of anal about it. You do want to remove all these little onion bits. I mean, I think this can. would make a great breakfast for dinner type. Food. That, that's exactly what we're doing. That's here what right we're now. doing. <laughs> that's what we're doing. I know. It's good that we could at least touch a subject matter that involved eggs. Right. Even though we're doing this in the heat train. Yes. Although I suppose for Jen in Alaska, this is probably a, a mid-afternoon situation oh. for you. <laughs> yes. Jen, what time is it there? Um, it is about 3.53 um, p.m. I'm still working. It's going to be a long night. And oh. the sun's probably going to go down at about 10 o'clock, 10.30. Okay. Ooh. Okay. Yeah, you're starting to get that uh, nice it's real, sun. what is it, the land of the midnight sun, right? Yes, ma'am. Yep. <laughs> so, just like before, we need to pour off oil, leaving only a small amount on the bottom. It's like two to three tablespoons worth of oil. So right into a heat safe dish. And then if you did, like me, manage to splash a little on the corners and you don't want smoke all over the place, wipe that little extra bit of oil off the corner of your pan. And now we get to do something fun. Right here, we have our beaten eggs. Just as I said, you add salt into eggs, they change colors a little bit. Perfectly normal and something we're looking for. Right here, we're gonna take our potatoes, throw them puppies in there. Use most of these, if not all. behind me and the onions that we have draining there dump those in as well then taking a wooden spoon or a rubber spatula gently bring everything together the reason you can't just lay these into the pan and pour the uh egg on top is just because you really do need the egg coating kind of going all the way around the potatoes mm -hmm. and the onions 
Then reactivate your skillet. Get the temperature nice and high because we're about to pour in some relatively colder eggs. Uh, these eggs were already sitting on the counter for about an hour, so they're room temperature. But since they're liquid, they're gonna pull heat out of the pan quite immediately. So I'm gonna let this heat go for just a moment before I decide to pour in my eggs. Keep that rubber spatula or wooden spoon near you. You're gonna need it. Make sure your oil's all over your pan. You have just enough pretty much to paint the whole bottom because my nonstick pan is slightly imbalanced on my stove, it wants to drift to one side. That's natural. Just keep it swishing around every so often. Then, so you can see, gently pour nice and close, nice and close so you don't end up splashing anywhere because there's a lot of oil in there. And the first thing you're gonna notice is an insane bubbling up around the edges. You want that. Give the pan slight wiggles. You wanna be careful when you're pouring in. If it seems like you're gonna overflow because your pan is too shallow, you need to stop pouring and not let all the egg get inside. But give your pan little wiggles. And you'll see this little skin starting to build up there. What I do is I reach into the middle of the pan all the way to the bottom with my rubber spatula or wooden spoon. And I stir all the way against the surface of the pan. This makes some of the eggs break through the shell that's making underneath there and causes them to start cooking underneath the surface, which is exactly what we want. Oh, that's looking delightful. Mm -hmm. Yes, Patricia, you'll add the potatoes and the onions to the Into egg. Into the egg, yes. Into a big bowl all together. When the egg liquid starts to diminish a bit, you'll notice because the egg is starting to cook, you're having less raw egg going on. That's when you're going to peek underneath your eggs. Whenever you start goldening, a little bit down under there. I know goldening is the key to it. <laughs> it's all about golden, baby. We don't want to brown. Whenever you just start to golden down inside of there is the moment when we're going to do the fun flippy part. So little extra skin, always handy for that part because it helps hold everything in once we flip and then put it back into the skillet. So I think, as I said earlier, if you're going to use fire, it's going to happen faster. If you're going to use a glass top, it's not going to happen as fast. Be a little patient. But once you start noticing a little goldening under there, not going to be able to show you because there's no way I can get a camera down under that. But you'll see here in a second. I'm going to turn off the heat before I lay the plate right on top of the pan. And then as quickly as I can, put your hand on top of the plate and flip. Ah! Golden. See that? Then it's a little brown, but that's not so bad. Then slip everything right back in. You might need your spoon. I lost a potato. We lost a potato. No shame, this happens. Oh, One okay. potato lost. So you're going to take your rubber spatula or spoon, tuck in around the edges a little bit, just by pushing. There we go. Oh, I lost the potato and oh. I have a little divot right where he belonged. <laughs> I can see the hole he left in my life. Oh. Rancid of potato jumping shit. Potato shaped hole in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the moment when you're going to have to be just a little patient. Turn that temperature to a medium low, if not completely to low, and just sit for it. You can kind of poke inside of the egg. You just poke that top. And you can feel where there's a little bit of sponginess and that's undercooked egg. Sometimes it's an air bubble. So be aware of that. You can really feel the difference between an air bubble and spongy undercooked egg. But you'll just have to be a little bit patient to the point where the heat begins to penetrate into the middle where the potatoes are and starts cooking the egg that's surrounding all of those potatoes. So I'm gonna put a couple of things out of the way as this sit and, and simmers so that we can make a nice plating. You had a lot of us on pins and needles while you were flipping that, <laughs> that egg. <laughs> I've, done, I've done that flip a lot, and trust me, it's a heck of a lot less nerve wracking than just turning an omelet sometimes. Mm. Have you ever had that omelet where you're like, this is going to be perfect if I can just get it to flip without breaking? <laughs> With this, the plate literally does the work for you. As, as long as your, your skillet is light enough, the flipping of the plate will make so much easier. 
move a couple of things here we do that. So I'm going to need a new plate to turn my portia out onto. Let's grab that now. And I think my knife should be just fine for this. How's it going in there, you guys? I got to check in while we're getting replated here, moving around. So I still feel a slight sponginess. I know that there's a little bit of under, just a little bit of undercooked egg in the middle. I'm going to turn mine off. Ooh, Joyce is showing us her potatoes here. Cooking, so cooking with like fire. This, my dears, turns straight over onto a plate. Make sure that your plate's big enough. This one just about made it. <laughs> Lindsay's still working on her potatoes too. Oh. Oh, we've got the onions in there too, Joyce. Nice. So a little bit of cilantro, a little bit of sour cream here. A lovely slice of this piece of heaven here. Hmm. I wonder if I have a spatula. Oh, that's what I'm You can see nice layers and a little bit of juiciness down inside of those potatoes. Set that puppy down just like that. Give yourself a nice scoop. Oh, I didn't taste my sofrito for salt yet. This is an important thing. Do not skip that. Salty enough. Ooh, just the right amount of spice, a little bit of smoke. Then the sour cream, I put it in an icing bag, especially when I have <laughs> larger parties because we teach large numbers of people here and using a spoon with sour cream. I mean, a dollop's nice every now and then, but if you wanna be able to have fun with some sour cream, put it in an icing bag and just nip the tip and you can give it a really nice, you know, zigzag. And then a few leaves, of some cilantro, and then we feed it to Abby. <laughs> For me? For me? Oh my she, goodness. Tortilla Española. Oh my goodness. It's a little spicy bacon sofrito. Ooh, breakfast with a little class. Delicious. Oh my goodness, okay. All right, moment of truth. I'll be the guinea pig for you guys. <laughs> it's a service I offer. You know, I'm willing to, to take one for the team, I guess. So let's let's dig right in here, get some of the sour cream. Oh, you're gonna love these it. These eggs, potatoes, I can tell the layers and everything. It's like the whole breakfast is just all there. A little cilantro. You know that happy dance you do when you have food that's really good? Because I'm happy dancing right now. Like I've got the bacon. Is it super hot? I hope you just burned my mouth. No, I didn't burn my mouth. It was just the right temperature. Mm -hmm. But this is delicious. Oh my gosh, you guys. I can't wait to hear how yours turns out because this is so good. There's so many flavors. I hope it looks as lovely as ours here. It's beautiful. I think the uh, the sour cream really, really takes it up a notch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As I great. mentioned, some cheese, like some cotilla cheese. Um, even just some cheddar, you know, mm -hmm. whatever you have sitting in your fridge might be just the ticket. Oh, that'd be delicious too. Mm -hmm. That would be great. It seems so humble. It really is a very peasanty kind of dish. There's nothing fancy about it, but you can make it fancy, especially just telling people what you're making. You're going to think you're making something fancy, but the truth is this is old world food. Yeah. Simple ingredients, making some really delicious flavor profiles. Yeah. It just depends on how you want to pick it up a notch. And that sofrito can go on top of just about anything. You can mm. put it in a sandwich. You can put it on top mm. of some grilled steak, chicken, or fish. I was just thinking on top of a burger. Yes. Maybe it, on a ciabatta roll or something. You could use it on a little bit of pasta. It's, it's like a rather thick thing, so you'd want to toss it a little bit. Sure. But it's, it's the heat level isn't too much. Am I crazy? Is it no. Just a good no, this is just, heat? yeah, this is just right. It's great. I think this would be a nice summer food if you're cooking. And Try Fresno chilies if you see them at your local grocery store. Be worth it. They're definitely worth it. They're great pepper. 
Well, <laughs> this is awesome. I'm gonna run back over in, on the computer and check and see how everything's gone for all of you, but I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you for hanging out with us tonight. Thanks and for ask being plenty here. Of questions while we're here. Yes, I'm gonna check, make sure before we log things out, but um, our next cooking night is going to be July 8th. Um, ooh, something's happening in downtown uh, Sharon. Somebody just got pulled um, over. Well, so there. we will have, it, it sounds like we might be doing some uh, around the world in 80 minutes kind of. Cold food preparation. Cold food preparation. kind of my idea, international with cold foods. We're gonna make something that's good for those dog days of summer so you can beat the heat and not have to worry about sweating it out in the kitchen. Foods you can eat more of without getting sweaty. Oh yeah, it'll be great. Okay, let me check the comments here. Everyone says, thank you. Sam, we will miss you too. I'm so glad you joined us. Um, somebody asked, are we supposed to have a tortilla wrap? Nope, nope. The tortilla becomes the, the eggs and yes. the potato. The actual origins of the word for tortilla that people commonly refer to as a tortilla is this dish. This is the original tortilla. The tortilla was based off of, you know, the many flatbreads that were all across Europe, but this was the actual thing called a tortilla at that point in time, not the flatbread. Lindsay also said that your giggle made her giggle. <laughs> so we're happy to make your evening. We're happy to make your evening, Lindsay. It's the music of the soul. Yes. I love your textual inquiries. Food and laughs and it's just all a great time. All right. Well, Patricia, oh, let's see. Joyce says, do you just put everything in egg once it's cooked and how long do I cook after? Okay, so um, you have to take the potatoes and the onions and pour them into the raw egg that were inside of the bowl, if you were watching earlier. They should already be inside of that soupy raw egg, and then you literally pour the egg with the potatoes and onions in it into the hot prepared skillet. So that's where it should be. The sofrito itself is a topping for once everything's finished. And if you need an idea of the appearance of, you know, the potato and the egg, I don't know. Oh, yes. It's Let me switch overhead. camera. Let's switch can it up you, here. Can you see that on that camera? I don't know if it's visible. I might just take a slice and lean back a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, the plate. Oh, this way? Other way. This way. We'll there we go. Yeah. There we go. You see those layers of the potato and the onion and things going on inside of there? Yeah, we can so see it's that. all inside because you poured it in mixed inside of the egg. If you tried to lay them into the skillet first and then pour the egg on top, you'd actually end up with the one side having bare onion and potato on it. And the egg wouldn't, uh, you actually would have difficulty getting the egg to cook thoroughly uh, simply for the fact that it would be insulated by all the potatoes being on the bottom of your skillet. Probably burn your potatoes before your eggs start to cook. Oh. Jen asked, what about Alaskan food to cook like ceviche with salmon? Ooh, I love preparing salmon. I would love to broil some salmon with you guys or just work with some smoked salmon. Mm. Maybe if we do a sushi roll, we'll do, we'll do like Philadelphia style with some smoked salmon or cream cheese in it. We'll keep it that would be delightful. Mm. Lindsay is but finally on her. Ooh. <laughs> let's, let's think about We'll these. think about this. We oh, have to yeah. apply. <laughs> we do. Lindsay's finally on her onions. Just want to make sure add egg with the potato. Yep. Yeah, we'll put the potato inside the egg. Yes, your and fried then, potatoes and onions go into the egg first. And then the you raw, put it in raw a, egg. And then and in that big mixing bowl, you just take all of those ingredients, you dump them straight into the slightly oiled skillet. The skillet should have about two tablespoons, two to three tablespoons of the oil remaining from what you fried your potatoes and onions in. You'll have to pour off all of the rest. You can save it to fry more things later, though, because it's not at all spent. There you go. And then you flip it after you do a little wiggling and make sure it's yes, all good. Yes, yes. As you may have seen me, like whenever I first pour them in, like A, you have to keep gently wiggling the pan and you have to poke at the bottom of the pan so that the eggs actually lift up and more raw egg goes underneath and fits the pan. That way you keep cooking the eggs and moving them around. The more they move around, the less solid and hard they will be. If you don't wiggle or move them around, you'll end up with a very firm, firm egg. Um, and super firm isn't what's desired here. Slightly soft is what's desired here. Uh, at which point, waiting about two to four minutes from the point where it hits the skillet, it took me about two and a half minutes before I had to flip it. 
after it went down in that skillet. Uh, if you're using a glass top, that could take as much as four minutes. And if your heat wasn't very well prepared, it could take slightly longer. But you're gonna note that the liquid level of your eggs begins to diminish underneath the, they sinks in and down to the potatoes. Cause as they cook, they kind of, uh, they don't actually puff up. They kind of shrink down into mm. everything. It absorbs into the potatoes a bit. That is the moment when I know to flip it. But peeking under the corner all the way to the bottom of the egg is very possible because if the egg's already cooking, it's gonna be a flapjack down there. And that's when you're gonna see this nice golden color underneath there. That's when you're ready to put the plate on top and give it the flip. And then whenever you do go to scrape your um, tortilla back into the pan, I should have already had my spatula in hand and I could have saved that one potato slice that ran away. The one potato that got away. But yeah, you have that near you. You can actually push it off into the pan. It'll prevent that circumstance. Be confident in your flip. Yeah, just be quick about it. There's not so, there shouldn't be so much raw egg that you're going to run all over the place. Just be nice and swift. It's not going to leak out anywhere. Just kind of take it, put it over the tray and pull away the plate and it, it should fall straight back in. And you'll need to keep cooking for another two to four minutes at that point to get it to the texture that you like. Joyce says her egg looks red now. I, I didn't put in any wine yet. It's, I think it's from the turkey bacon. Does that make sense? Did she put the sofrito into the eggs? You put the sofrito in with the eggs? Yeah, I didn't. I wasn't supposed to, huh? I no, think. but I, you made well, a whole new dish. Sofrito <laughs> uh, Sofrito is a topping. I, I, oh. I tried to mention that several times. That's why it's I'm still sorry. here in my skillet. It goes on oh. top of the dish. Oh, well. It doesn't go into the eggs. Oh, well. The only thing that goes into the eggs are your potato and onions that you fried separately in the small oh. skillet with lots of oil. <laughs> okay, so I guess but I you've made fried it up. Dish. Thanks. I'm sorry about that. No, oh, it's still, don't apologize. Now you know. Yeah, <laughs> it's you know what? It'll all work those flavors in together. It's going to be something different, but you know, and, and it if works. your eggs are like red and everything, don't worry about that. These flavors all work <laughs> together really nicely. Oh yeah. If you can still fry those eggs up, they're still going to be delicious. Mm -hmm. You can probably even still make that whole skillet feel. It's just once you get all these peppers and onions into it, it's getting closer to a frittata. And there's more ingredients in that. It's very cultural. We've got Bridget wants to eat the sofrito with a spoon. Yes. Yes. I yes. don't blame you. Absolutely. I could too. That's the spirit. I could too. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, um, we'll go ahead and wrap it up for this evening. Thanks again for being here. Uh, like I said, our next class will be July 8th. I hope you guys take a break, take some time off in these next few weeks. Um, just to rest because you've earned it. And uh, congratulations to everyone who's graduating this semester. We're really excited for you and we hope to see you soon. All right, have a good night.